So uh, last week I did something extraordinarily stupid. Um, I presented this at the uh, Web last month, and last week I just decided to convert the entire presentation to Markdown and try this new uh, piece of presentation software. So this might entirely blow up. So this is how. Um, my first exposure to open source was in 2004, at the right age of 16, uh, where I had an opportunity to intern with the Linux Technology Center at IBM on um, the code stuff. And um, that was a great experience. After that, I kind of floundered a bit. I tried some QA stuff and some software engineering stuff. Nothing really stuck. So I graduated to my CS um, at BS and CS in 2009 and decided I'd try to be a software engineer or something. Um, that didn't work out so well either. So um, about that time, I got a call from an open source company based out of Portland called Puppet Labs. And uh, since then, I've been a UX designer. So it's worked out really well. Um, this is called Show Off. So if any of you are interested in, in seeing this later, I'm happy to demo it. But if you go to 100in2.danielsobble.com uh, and hit G, uh, you'll follow along with the slide design. Rest. And if you mouse over on this toolbar, then you'll get a handy form where you can submit questions um, in real time. So I'll do my best to answer them as we go along, or I'll assist them. <coughs> so to start, I'd like to give a little bit of background about uh, myself and where I work, and so you can use that as context for the rest of the talk. This is me. Um, most of the time, this is my game face in front of my monitor. Um, but I'm a UX designer by day, I uh, dabble visual design and UX research. Uh, by night, I uh, enjoy writing, blogging, and whatnot. And then uh, for play, I'm a pretty avid hiker and runner. So feel free to hit me up if you'd like to do any of those things. So I work at Puppet Labs, and how many of you here are familiar with Puppet Labs? Okay, let's well, try enough. I'll give a brief overview of what it is we do. So basically we're all about server configuration. So if you are a system administrator, um, you're probably responsible for managing some number of nodes. If you have a lot of nodes in your infrastructure, you're probably part of a larger sysadmin team. Now where public comes in is we introduce a layer between um, humans who run the, the servers and servers themselves. And that's called public code. So what public code does is it allows you to say, I'm going to define my infrastructure as code, and then I'm going to let public go out and force that for me. So um, it's a leveraging tool, it helps uh, uh, eliminate the human error that comes from manual tweaks and treating your service like snowflakes. And so it allows uh, a single sysadmin to manage an astonishing large number of machines. And we are definitely hiring, so please let me know if you have any questions. So at Puppet, um, we treat research very seriously. And the reason why we treat research seriously is because it helps us determine if we're building the right things. Um, and the trick is that our target audience of sysadmins are uh, astonishingly busy. And so getting an hour or an hour with them to sit down and run through a user test or a discovery into is really quite difficult. So we had this problem for a, a couple of years where uh, it would take months to get five or six requisite users to actually do a, a proper study. And so to get around this problem, we set up a program called Puppet Test Pilots. And what Puppet Test Pilots is, is a pool of users um, that have reached out to us and said, I'm interested in providing feedback on new features as they come down the pipeline. So we have about 700 people in this pool, and we reach out to each person about once every three months or so with an opportunity. Um, for engagement. So a typical test pilot session is we uh, schedule some time with them, usually five or six at a time, sit down um, either for a remote or an in-person interview, and either go for a prototype on a laptop or perhaps a discovery interview from a or something. And we usually end it with some sort of So now let me talk about user testing a bit, because this is probably the reason why all of you are here. User testing is a very valuable tool to, um, I, I define it as a formalized way of getting feedback on uh, a feature that you're thinking about shipping to your customer base. 
Um, and even though this, this talk is, is labeled how to run 100 user tests, um, there are definitely other types of testing that is, are equally valuable depending on where you are. So we do lots of discovery and use usability tests and things like that. So this is where the topic of this, this talk comes from. Um, about two years ago, um, our company was trying to figure out what we were going to do at our annual conference in San Francisco. And so the UX team got together, and we were kind of talking through things. And then as this brand new UX guy, I raised my hand and I asked, what if we ran as many user tests as possible at the conference? You know how I used it the impersonal we, so I figured someone else would probably run this. Fortunately, my boss, Randall, turned to me and said, that's a great idea. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> but it went very well. We got a plan together. Uh, we got some volunteers, we ran testing, and you know we came out with 50 user tests that first year. And it went so well that we decided to repeat it the next year, and this time we almost doubled the number of tests we ran to 95. So it went pretty well. So now I'd like to talk through uh, the things that we did, um, and then I'll go through it and talk about the things that we learned, and then some ideas for how you might pull this off successfully yourselves. So I kind of struggled for a while with how to present this, so I think I'm going to present them side by side. So the 2012 thing will be on the left, and the 2013 thing will be on the right. So place, where did we do testing? So I mentioned San Francisco. The first year we did it at the Mission Bay Conference Center, and the second year we did it at the Fairmont Hotel. Definitely come to the right. Um, our booth was very different from year to year. So the first year we were sequestered in this hallway, um, between our recruiting booth and our demo booth. So we had two blue tables in the middle. Um, which, there was enough space, it was too loud, uh, we had great visibility, but not both of the two things. So the next year we decided to kind of expand out a little bit, and so we got four tables, picked a dedicated room for this. Um, and the nice thing about this, it was actually in the surf room, those of you who are familiar with the Paramount. The surf room is separated from the, the hallway by a half wall, so people walking past can still see through the paint glass and get an idea of what's going on. So we didn't feel like we were, you know, lacking visibility. People still saw us and knew what was going on. Process. The first year, our, our process was pretty dead simple, and it didn't work out so well accordingly. Uh, basically, somebody would come to the booth, we greet them, tell them what we were doing. If we could, we try to recruit them for our public test pilot program. Um, if they wanted to test with us at the conference, we would have them sit down with a um, facilitator, and then once those tests were done, they would get some swag, usually a book and a t-shirt. And uh, there were a couple problems with this, so we fixed uh, those holes by adding a screening process where we would get, get a really quick idea for the sorts of tests that would be most applicable to each person. And then we closed with a bit of analysis. So we have the facilitator come back to the computer um, after the testing was over, fill out a brief survey um, saying what, what we learned for each of the tests. We had our hypothesis listed out for each test, so they knew exactly what we were trying to validate and could tell us roughly whether those things were validated or not. Equipment. So first year we had uh, four laptops and three manila folders stuffed full of testing scripts. That was a disaster. Uh, oh, what's my script? I don't know. Put it over there. Ah. So the second year we switched over to using um, proper notebook binders that worked a lot better. We also used dedicated mics uh, because we were in that tight hallway space that built-in laptop mics worked work so well. So that was helpful. Then we also provided some, some real pens and paper for the stations that people could sketch out the things they were trying to inspect. And that really helped eliminate a lot of communication. So the testing. So the results of the testing were we had five studies the first year, six studies the second year, and we basically doubled the number of tests we did. So we had an average of 15, 16 tests per study in 2013. What these numbers don't tell you is that the first year we did this, because not all of our tests were created equal, so to speak, um, we had a very uneven distribution. So I think one test got like 27 run-throughs, and two of them got like two. So obviously, balancing that out really helped us 
to um, uh, get a more even sense of, of learning to each, each day. And an interesting side effect was that we inadvertently lost between one third and two thirds of our data each year. So the fact that we had more even leveling in that second year really saved our bacon. I'll talk about that embarrassing story later. People, who did we have helping us out? So we had kind of two groups of volunteers. We had people before the conference who were helping us write the test, get them ready for, for showtime. And then we had volunteers at the conference itself who helped us run this. Um, so the first year, I was one of the test authors. I wrote four tests. Uh, and um, in the second year, we had four authors. So I, I still wrote two, but it was much more easy to distribute. It was great. So what did we learn? Five things. The first thing is that it's a really bad idea to ignore your product roadmap. So the first year we did this, I was scrambling and trying to figure out what we were going to test at this big conference. And my method for doing this was to send out an email to the entire company asking for random ideas. I got lots of random ideas. The problem is that because those things weren't tied to what we were planning to ship, then I was largely just guessing at what would be most relevant and useful and so forth. This is kind of a basic uh, uh, development pipeline. And uh, this is, I think this is very highly relevant when you're trying to decide what it is you're going to test. So you have discovery where you're trying to unearth what the problems are that your users have. Definition where you're trying to decide what problems you're going to actually solve. Design where you are solving those problems. Build where you're building the solutions. And then testing where you're making sure that things aren't going to blow up. Sorry, for work. And then ship where the thing actually goes out the door. Um, so this is important for a couple of reasons. The first thing is that if you don't know when something is going to ship, then choosing to test that thing is probably uh, not a great use of your time. Secondly, if you have that ship date and you know where you are in this development cycle, it will help you know what kind of tests to prepare for the actual event. So if you're in the discovery phase, you probably want to do discovery interviews. If you're in definition, probably mental models. Design, user tests, building, usability tests, testing. Here you're probably looking at discovery for the next big thing. Because I kind of went into this with a, with a pre, predefined notion of user testing, I didn't really pay attention to where various things were in their development cycle. And so I kind of use user testing as a nuclear weapon to, to land base all the time. So next year we use a more even distribution of, of uh, tests depending on where they work, and that worked a lot better for us too. Second thing we learned is that you don't have to write every study yourself. This probably seems really obvious in retrospect. Uh, the first year I wrote four tests, and they were kind of garbage. Uh, one of my colleagues wrote one, and his was great. Um, the reason why this is really important is uh, because in my mind, when I think about writing a user test, I think about putting words on a page and then going and talking with the user about things I put on the page. But if I am a, a brand new uh, volunteer to use the concept of user testing, then I'm not even going to know what user testing means, much less how to follow the user test script and get useful information from it. So there's a whole lot of things that you have to do in order to get tests that are meant to be run at a conference to a place where the volunteers that you probably have are capable of running those tests. So it probably took about four, which would have taken about four times longer than I thought it was going to. So the fact that we had those more evenly distributed in the second year really helped a lot. Third thing we learned was that you don't want to pick a boot from the busiest hall possible. Now, the thing I was optimizing for that first year was visibility. I wanted to uh, make sure that we were cram packed the entire time and had no gaps and could run as many tests as possible. But there were a couple of other areas that I didn't really pay attention to. And um, after having a great experience the following year, I'm kind of breaking it down to three main areas. First is visibility, the second is the sound quality of the space you're in. So, because we were kind of back from the, the hallway that second year, it really helped um, us pick up more audio. And then also just having enough elbow room to do your thing. Uh, the first year we had two tables that were about this length, and in my mind I was thinking, you can fit two stations there, right? Two people sitting side by side. 
didn't work so good. So one table per test station worked much better for us. Another thing we learned was that you don't want to skip on the spot analysis. And what I mean by this is that the purpose of running user tests isn't really to run user tests. The purpose of a user test is to learn things and then actually implement the learnings. So uh, it kind of comes down to that basic build, measure, uh, build, learn, build, measure, learn, measure, build, learn. It's a loop you can start in. <laughs> <laughs> so the first year we did this, kind of, I, I was all about discovery during the conference. You know, all I wanted to do was get video recordings, get them home safely, and cuff them to my wrist, and then, you know, absorb them in the future. But what that ends up doing is, weeks later when you're reviewing those videos, you're having to upload all that context all over again. And so you're having to, in essence, start from scratch. And that takes a lot more time. And in our case, the things that we learned didn't actually get implemented into the product until months or years after we actually did the testing. So from an efficiency standpoint, it was a bit of a disaster. The second year we did this, we tried to combine the learning and discovery aspects into the event itself. So what we did, like I mentioned, is we had our facilitators fill out surveys, which we then aggregated in a spreadsheet. And so we learned things just as soon as we were done testing at the event. And so that, that was really helpful. Now, some people go a step further, and they actually cram this entire loop into the event itself. So you're running tests, you're aggregating the results of those tests, and you're making changes to your code, and then you're repeating that process. I think that works really good for certain things, like especially usability tests, where the goal is to converge on um, very small tactical areas of your design. It's supposed to be with those. Uh, final thing is don't assume that your data is safe once you hit record. Um, this is by far the most embarrassing thing. Uh, oh. 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 Yeah, first year we had one of our laptops mysteriously wiped when we got home. Who knows? And the second year, two of our laptops were stolen sometime during the process of shipping them back. Uh, now, this is awful, but the fact that we had facilitators taking those learnings, putting them into a spreadsheet, meant that we had all that stuff in the cloud. So we had all our preliminary findings intact. And all we lost were the hardware and the videos. Uh, so, Keep your hardware safe, keep your data safe, but if you have to choose, you know, data is by far more valuable. You shouldn't have to choose. <laughs> so just to sum that up, uh, don't ignore your product roadmap, don't write your study yourself, don't pick a booth in the busiest hallway, don't skip on-spot analysis, and don't assume the data is safe. So now, I'm gonna to shift to some tips for success. Um, and we haven't actually successfully done all these things, but based on the results of those two years of testing, I think these are kind of areas where we need to evolve in the future to be better at this. The first thing is to find a diverse audience. So diversity can mean many things. What I mean here is uh, this graph. So because we ran testing at a conference that our company put on, um, we pretty much had only part of this is high number. Customers are people who currently use your software. Perspectives are people who don't, but they have a problem that your solution solves, and they know that. And the potentials are people who have a problem that you meet, but they don't even know you exist, or don't know that you're a potential solution to the problem. And so at PubConf, pretty much all, all we had was feedback from those first two segments. And we were ignoring this entire um, universe of people who need to know about us, but don't. So, uh, in the future, picking a conference that doesn't consist primarily of our own constituents is, is probably uh, a great idea. The second thing is to train early and often. So I mentioned early that, earlier that um, a lot of our volunteers were people who were very comfortable with the idea of user testing. And the reason for this is that public conference is staffed primarily by our own employees. So, um, the way you get to go to public comp is by helping out with the conference in some way. And so because we were doing user testing, people who helped us do user testing could be a part of this. And so we got people from sales, from marketing, from engineering, from product, all sorts of different areas. And the great side effect of this is that it's a fantastic way to build empathy. Like most of these people don't necessarily get that day-to-day -day interaction with customers. I mean, even UX people don't get day-to-day -day interaction with customers all the time. 
time. So the fact that even if all you get out of this is getting your people sitting down with your users and having conversations, that's fantastic. Like forget about the data and what you learn. Just just getting that empathy built is, is great. But if you actually want to, 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 to train them to conduct effective user tests, then um, what we did in 2013 was starting off with an overview meeting. So we scheduled this for between two and three weeks after uh, before the conference happened. Um, so we were close enough that we knew exactly what we were doing, but not so um, uh, far away that they would be a story. So there we would have, uh, we would talk through our process, we would talk through the different tests we were doing, we would um, explain uh, what the expectations of user testing was. And after that, we would have each test author schedule um, uh, uh, simple sessions with one or two volunteers and have them practice running the test on each other so they could get some hands-on experience. With the side effect that the test author could, could observe this and learn and, and make his test easier to understand. Um, so that you ideally sit down with the strip, having never seen it before, and conduct it perfectly. The next thing was to that we did was to share all of our documentation early and often. So all the things that we showed in the overview meeting, practice testing, they had hands-on access to. Because we have a lot of remote employees, um, they didn't necessarily get to attend these meetings, so that was uh, valuable for them to have. And then finally, it's just one-on-one -on -one feedback. So if you're coordinating something like this, you might have people, some volunteers coming up to you and being like, I can't do this. And if that happens, then um, possibly you can shut them into a role that's a little bit less intimidating for them, like maybe a reading role, just explain what, what it is you're doing. Um, or maybe you can encourage them to, uh, to have the confidence to actually do user testing sitting down with, mm -hmm. it's scary, but sitting down and, and, and uh, walking through a prototype. So the result is that we had a lot of people who came out of this whole training process and conference just very enthused about help, the things that we were trying to do. And um, I think the second year, we had a lot of volunteers come back again, and then we had users who tested with us the first year, come back the second year and say, I enjoyed that so much, can I do it again? Um, what, what did you do with the things that, that, that you learned from the testing? It was, it was just great, great feedback for us. Another tip is to keep things digital if at all possible. Um, the poster child for this, in our case, was NDAs. So we had everybody who took a test with us sign an NDA. Um, and we had them sign paper copies that we kept in a manila folder. Uh, and so we had to truck that back with us, keep it in a filing cabinet. It was kind of a pain. So the second year, we switched to DocuSign. And we had that for um, digital signing of quality agreements. And I'm not in love with the, the DocuSign workflow. It's kind of janky. A lot of clips, a lot of places to sign your initials. But overall, the fact that you had all these virtualized was super helpful. OK, so think about self-guided tests as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we had 16 volunteers, which is a lot. But the reason why we needed 16 volunteers is because every test we did was a qualitative test. So you have to have a facilitator paired with a user with a computer and then um, taking notes. Versus uh, a, a self-guided test where you have somebody sitting down a computer uh, or running through a series of tasks in the browser, all that information is captured automatically. Um, you learn different, kind of, different kinds of things, but um, if you don't have a lot of volunteers that you can take advantage of, you can still get a lot of tests run simply by automating some of those, those human interactive bits. And then the final tip I would have is uh, to hold a retrospective. So how many of you here have held a retrospective? Okay, so about half. Um, retrospective, the way we do ret retrospectives is we get the entire team who's involved in testing in the same room. We have three columns on board, keep, stop, and try. So we spend the first 15 minutes having everybody write things on sticky notes and put them under the appropriate column. And then after that's done, we elect a victim to get up and categorize those in groups of sticky notes. And then as, as, as a team, we kind of talk through each category and assign an action item to each category. Uh, 
And then once that's done, we have a list of things that can make the process better next time. Things that we decided to stop doing, keep doing, to try to do. And we assign one action item to each person in the room, and that person is responsible for seeing it done. Uh, so that's how, I mean, that's how uh, a lot of the, the ideas in, in this presentation came up was we had a chance to just kind of reflect on and think about the process and how it was working. So to sum those up, uh, finding a diverse audience, training early and often, keeping things digital, self-guided tests, and holding retrospectives. So that's all the slides I have prepared. Um, there are a few other things I can talk about, but if there are questions. How long is the typical test? Typical test, we ran, so we, we kept the testing session with each user for about 25 minutes. And so we found that 25 minutes was about enough to do between one and three tests per person. What kind of swag were you rewarding people with? Okay. And that, that's, a, that's a chunk of time. Yeah. Um, the, at, at the conference, we gave each person a, a t shirt and a copy of Pro Puppet. Um, for our Puppet Test Pilot program, we gave each person a $50 gift certificate to Amazon. Kind of data. Yeah. So that, that probably worked pretty well because you already had a kind of a built in user base and people who already knew about your product. Do you know, give me advice for um, your doing user testing on something that's not really well known or a product that's, that's new in, in order to get enough people in the door to do the testing? Hmm. Yeah, so. Even though I mentioned that like, a lot of people were perspectives, in our case, it, at our conference, often perspective can be, I hear there's this thing called Puppet. I need puppets. How do I apply puppets to what I do? So they're trying to learn about the product. So I think in, in that case, having that creator role is really, really essential because that person can kind of talk about your product, talk about your service, explain what the benefits are, kind of get them excited about it. And once they're excited about it, then they're far more likely to say, sure, I'm willing to, to get some feedback on this. Now, the thing, of course, is that depending on what you're trying to learn, it could be that, that the test you run is appropriate for somebody who's super duper experienced in the thing that you're trying to improve. Or maybe, you know, somebody who's never seen it before can still kind of drop what it's about. So sysadmins who've never used Puppet still kind of have an idea of what sysadmin things you might be able to do with Puppet and you can get some feedback there. So I guess it's a kind of question of how, like, what do you want to learn and how rigorous does that need to be? Like, just a conversation can be interesting as long as you capture it. Um, so I'm a little unclear on uh, how you actually, so other than the, the survey, like the, the written feedback basically from the person running the test yep. is able to go in, how you captured um, the user's behavior, like what they do, were you videotaping them as they went, were you Screen recordings, like what was the the output there? Yeah, so we use Silverback for all of our testing. How many of you use Silverback? Just a few, okay. So Silverback is a, is a fantastic application. It's OS X only. Um, you run, it, it captures the screen, it captures the audio, it captures the video of the user. So the screen, uh, the, the user's kind of in a picture in picture below. So that way you get the motions, you get the paper and so forth. It is, it's also late, but you mentioned um, you know, you had these scripts and you had some bad scripts and you programmed some good scripts. Talk about like what is in a script and what makes a script good and bad. Yeah, totally. Um, I think I should just bring up an example. You can see that I think. So first starting out, the facilitator has control of the laptop. And at that point, 
they are able to open this test script in the laptop and follow these instructions to get the test up and running. And so we have, you know, open Competo, open VMware, on VM, open terminal, cessation, do these things. Instructions for resetting the test for the next person. Um, once they have that out of the way, um, they would give control of the laptop over to the participant. And at this point, they would switch over to their hard copy that was located in the notebook binders. Um, the motivation um, section would typically be read beforehand, so they had some, some idea of, of why we were writing the test at all. And below that, we have the, the specific hypothesis that we were validating. So they could refer back to this during the test if they were kind of curious how things were going. Um, below that, we would have a brief uh, entrance interview sort of thing. So we had kind of the screening process, and then we had kind of some test-specific questions that we had integrated into each test. So how would you describe your role? How long have you been using? How many notes do you manage? What the environment, development environment do you use? And then after they were done with the questions, they move into the tasks. And so we had um, the tasks. Uh, optional prompts in case things kind of went off the a little bit. And then just a reminder to thank them. Um, and then this was for the evaluation section where they were going back and trying to, to report the findings. So that's kind of a, a we, we had the same template for all of our tests. And um, this was a particular good. Yeah. You mentioned it was a uh, tool used in capturing the NDAs. So Yes. What's the word? DocuSign. DocuSign? Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. So we, we kind of worked with them um, uh, specifically to create this solution for ourselves as kind of a one-off to, um, to kind of facilitate the, the signing of NDA specifically. I don't know if they have any good kind of solution which do the same thing, but it worked very well. And just for reference, Silverback. It's a really testing tool we use. You said that was Mac only. Are there other tools that, that work well on Windows that we're talking about? I don't know. I can't yeah, Camtasia and Murray. They're both commercial solutions, but you can try them for free. You can download them and use them for a while. What was that second one? Camtasia and Murray. Made by the same company. One does more than the other. Any other questions? You mentioned uh, like doing different types of uh, testing at different stages in, in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, and like earlier in the, yeah. the pipeline, they're more um, exploratory or interview possibly um, so what, what what did that play out like in the, the conference situation did you have tests like that or, or more in discovery or yeah um, I guess the question if we just if we had tests that did each of these things or yeah well I'm, I guess I'm trying to picture and I'm, I'm hitting a wall as to what that looked like you have with this model with the laptop and someone going through the steps, which doesn't seem to fit with me with interviewing them. So I'm just wondering what, what actually happened at that table. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, so um, laptop tests were the, were the general rule, but, but there were definitely exceptions. So um, in 2013, we had a card sort of thing. So we had basically a, a large piece of poster board, a bunch of index cards, and we put them in front of the user and said, no, organize these. Um, it was actually, it was the designer own dashboard sort of thing. So, because it, 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 because it wasn't like a paper prototype where you want to capture all the, the entire process of, of solving it, we found that all you need to do is take a picture of the smartphone and email it off. If you're going to do paper prototyping, you're probably going to need like an overhead camera or something. Like that. Uh, the discovery interviews are really easy though. Um, we use, I think we still use Silverback for those, but all, all you needed was the audio. So. Is that it for questions? Okay, give him a hand. There's a really great online card sorting tool um, called Optimal Sort. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. 
and it records the data for you, and you can run the unattended card sorts, and it will produce wonderful charts for you, and yes. um, it's really nice. And it has a companion um, called TreeJack. So when you're working on information architecture, you might do the card sorting exercise first, see how users think about your information objects, and then you can make that into a tree, like a, a spreadsheet outline, yeah. and feed the spreadsheet to a tree jack, and it will make that into a clickable hierarchy with your labels, and then you can run user tasks, unattended again, with your uh, online users, and they can go in and look for particular things in your information architecture, and the tool will keep track of whether they found it or not. Yeah. And, and again, show you these wonderful graphs of like how many people found the thing, how direct was the route, where did people get lost, yeah. so that you can iterate and retest. We've used it a online tool called Concept Code Manager, or Byproduct Code Manager, TreeJet, and Optimal Source. Really great tools. Yeah. So I'll have to check out that one too. We can split this out with these charts as well. There's no fact quite that detail. What's that one called? And this concept codified that. Uh, yeah.